So one of the benefits of having two services is that you guys get the condensed version of my sermon. But I do feel it's important for me to start with a story, a story that I have permission to share with you, um, because I think, I do believe that it ties into this interaction that we have with Rahab, and how the story of Rahab can actually still speak to us, and inform us, and shape us today. This story is about a friend of mine who I had met 13 years ago. He and I met, we were both undergraduates at the University of Utah. He was studying sociology and I was studying philosophy. So mostly we would congratulate each other on having the two least marketable degrees anyone could ever want to pursue. But as it turned out, he and I, of course, in our now 13 years of friendship, grew to have meaningful conversations. And, and even though he would not have self-identified as a Christian, he had some experience and interaction within the church and had all sorts of questions, objectives, and objections, and complaints about the church. And for the better part of eight years, our, our, our weekends at the restaurant were, were, were conversations about these things. And there would be times when I would come home, and if you've ever shared your faith with somebody who is asking and you see a inquisitive, uh, inquisitive face, you, you, you perceive or sense a, a spirit that's open to truth, it, it, it's exciting, it's exhilarating, and there would be times I would come home and I would, I would tell Tara, hey, man, I got to talk to Josh about Jesus and about the kingdom, and I, I think he's really close. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Like, I see faith coming alive. Oh, this is great. Josh is going to be a Christian, and I can mark one on my chalkboard, you know, as, as you know, a soul one, and however we think about those things. And then we would go back, I'd go back to work the next week, and it was like we took two steps forward and 4,000 steps backwards. And I would be so frustrated because oftentimes I felt like I didn't express the truth of the Christian faith well enough. And, and perhaps I was, perhaps the truth is, is I was relying on my own sense of cunning and my own ability to make an argument that I thought would convince him. But I remember coming home one week and I looked at Tara and if she were here, if she were here, she would verify that this is the truth. I said, hey, I, I think I'm done talking to my friend about Jesus. It's just too frustrating. And my wife had become friends with him as well, and of course she encouraged me to think else, to think about it otherwise. And during that week as I was in prayer and I was actually still praying for my friend and I was letting the Lord know that I was done talking to him, I really felt the Holy Spirit tell me something like this. Mario, if you want to quit talking to your friend, that's fine but then you'll be like every other Christian he's ever met. And I remember thinking, all right, I can keep after it. And so for eight years, we had conversations about matters of faith, about ultimate things, about justice in the world, about the political state of the world, about what is right and what is wrong about virtue, standards. For eight, nine years, frustrated, hopeful. We'll come back to that story in just a few minutes. The story here that we find within the book of Joshua is one that I feel still has a sense of urgent relevant for us today. And while I won't have time in this service to give you a lot of the background information, it's important for us to know that the name Joshua in Hebrew means Yahweh is salvation. It means that uh, it, was a, it was a name given to suggest, to remind us that all throughout scripture, we are reminded of this one sure fact that it is God who saves, it is God who seeks, it is God who provides, it is God who pursues, it is God who purifies, it is God who sets apart, and it is God who is working toward his end. That we never live in a world that has not been 
marked by, purchased with the presence and the reality of God. Interestingly enough, for those of you who like this kind of thing, of all the Old Testament characters, Joshua is the only one of the Old Testament characters whose political and military life that's recorded for us in Scripture does not have any scandal to it. Boy, wouldn't that be nice. But Jesus' name is Aramaic for Joshua as well. So even this story is a signpost to this ultimate reality. And what I believe this text would have us think about today is this. That even as God is using Joshua as a servant leader now to prepare his people to possess this land, that Joshua has in mind the end. And that for us as a church, if I could give us any sense of encouragement, any call to action, is that I believe we live in an urgent day and age where we are called to live with the end in mind. And when I'm talking about end, I'm not talking about gloom, doom, and despair. I am talking about the end of our story that ends with a new heavens and a new earth coming down from God where death, sin, chaos, cancer, fragmented relationships are no more. Where there is a river that runs from God's throne throughout throughout the city and that there are trees that are grown on both sides that provide healing for the nations. That end in mind where we are told that every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every voice sees and recognizes and gives praise to what God has done in the world through Jesus. That end in mind. And all throughout Scripture, we have this idea that even as Jesus, or through the Spirit, as, as God inspires the prophets to write these things, that there is always the end in mind. Forty years have passed since that fateful fateful event when Moses had sent his spies into Canaan. So here's your quiz to see if you were listening. Twelve spies, how many came back with a good report? Just two. Joshua and Caleb. So it makes complete sense to me that Joshua only sends two spies. Joshua, I believe, is expecting a full report. Joshua was convinced then and he is convinced now that indeed God was giving them the land, that God was was handing over to them their their long-promised possession. But now quickly, I want to get to the faith of Rahab. Because what we have to understand for the most part is that the people of Israel, as they were going into this new land, would have seen Jericho as an obstacle They would have seen Jericho as an obstacle and most likely they would have seen the inhabitants within Jericho as detrimental to this calling of God establishing them in this land beyond the Jordan. And yet what we find here is that these two spies, as they go into Jericho, they meet this prostitute named Rahab who for whatever reason has understands and knows that they are spies. Scripture doesn't give us that insight as to how they were able to understand that. But what we have here is this interaction with Rahab, who gives them a report. Now let's think about this for just a couple of minutes. If you send spies into a land, you are expecting a report, and perhaps what kind of information are you looking for? Now I've never served on military intelligence, so I don't know how the spy game works. Actually, I do. This pastor gig is just my cover. (laughs) But ultimately, we can think about it this way. I am sure that for most of us, when we think about espionage and spy, what we are looking for are weak links, lack of integrity within personnel, places of vulnerability in which we can can leverage our sense of superiority to weasel our way into any particular kind of invasion to ensure our sense of victory. We want data. We want details. But Rahab does not give the spies. Rahab does not give the spies a report of the number of troops. She does not give them military strategy, nor does she tell them about Jericho's king. She does not tell them about the deployment of Jericho's army, the vulnerable spots along the wall. 
What we see here in this report calls us to what I believe we are being called to today. Rahab says this, you want a report? You want to understand what's going on? We have heard about your God. We have heard the stories. It has gotten back to us that this God that you serve dried up the Red Sea. We have heard how your God has delivered your two Amorite kings who were bent on your destruction. And we as a people are melting like wax before your God. Rahab's report had little to do with the things that she could see and everything to do with what was going on behind the God who was delivering his people. Rahab makes what I would say is a profession of faith where she sees that this God is indeed Joshua's God, it's Israel's God, and for us today here this morning, it is our God. Now you have heard and seen this here in this congregation, and I've only been here for a few months, but for a while now, and that is this. It's been said this way in different ways and forms and through the different voices, and that is we desire to join Jesus on his mission. We've all heard that in some way, shape, or form, right? We talk about this and how we share God's love. But I want us to think about it this way. Rahab is living in a volatile time in her people's history. Most of her countrymen are afraid and are anxious and are worried about a future that seems uncertain. Tell me if any of this sounds familiar. She sees people melting in fear about stories of this great God. And if I could put it to you this way, what I'm seeing is this. Rahab sees God at work and she wants to join him on his mission. Rahab sees God at work and wants to join and provides hospitality and grace and preserves the life of the spies. And so for us here, as we look at the life of Rahab, a life lived with the end in mind, even if she was not sure of the details, what we find is that her place in God's salvation story is forever marked. She is a part of Jesus' own genealogy. The author of Hebrews includes her into this, uh, into this chapter of faith that we read about. And so what are the lessons we can learn from Rahab? And I have to quickly wrap this up. I apologize. If we can go to the summary points as well. Before we get to this, let me just say this. What does our church, what does our culture think about the church? But I even think more essential to that is what do we believe about who God is and what our mission is as the church? And even though the setting was a bit different, cult Rahab's culture was full of fear, full of anxiety, full of uncertainty. And our culture is no different. People's senses of well-being anymore rest on who is or who isn't in public office. And we tend to demonize and demo um, de marginalize and look down upon those who think differently than us, who hold different positions. We too, I can be overcome by fear and anxiety and join my voices with those who are not telling the story that God has acted within human history, but one that looks at the world and says the sky is falling. But I'm reminded here in this story as I look at Rahab's faith, is that we are called to be a prophetic voice in our community, a voice that has the end in mind, a voice that is not determined by who we vote in or who we elect or who is not elected, but by a king who came to serve and to offer and to give his life as a ransom for many, a king who died and bled on a cross to reconcile us back to the Father, to forgive us of our sins, and not just reconcile us, but to reconcile our enemies, to reconcile creation itself, and to begin to establish a new creation, which he is surely doing now, even as we speak. 
That is the end in mind, and that is the message. And brothers and sisters, believe me when I tell you that I believe that our world is hungry, longing for a community in a, vo in a world with lots of noise that will love their enemy, that will turn the other cheek, that will walk the extra mile, that will hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, that will walk in faithful obedience to Christ and in reverent service to one another. And we will have people all around our community who will be like Rahab in a world of chaos and noise to say, I don't know what's going on, but we have heard this story. We've heard this story of a God who has died and who is resurrected and who forgives and who transforms and who sets free. That's the story that we are called to live in. And that's the story for us to have in mind. And I believe if we can take our cue from Rahab, we can find ourselves again living within this story of proclaiming the good work that God has done in the world through Jesus and to join him in that knowing that he calls people to himself. Now, let me finish this story with my friend Josh and then I'm gonna have the kids come up real quick. Nine years, eight, nine years, we have this conversation. I invite him to an Easter service because my, uh, my daughter was singing in the choir. And if he were here, he would tell you this, that during the service, he wanted to get up and leave because he was really uncomfortable. He said, but I could hear the two girls singing behind me. And I remember hearing their voices and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, if I could only sing like that, if I could only have joy in my heart to sing. So this is just a little plug. The reason why we want you to sing is not because, well, it's not only good for you, because it kind of lifts off the spirit of like singing is a way of doing spiritual warfare and praying, but it also serves as an encouragement to those around you who may be discouraged. So it never is about us, ever. And this was the lesson I learned with my friend. He said, I would have got up and left. He says, but you know, it was interesting when we were de we, uh, during communion, he said, your pastor, who was uh, Pastor Jeff, he was my mentor. He said he got up there, and, and for those of you who have been born and raised into a, a liturgical environment, some of, this phrase, some of this will make sense, but he had done the words of institution. He d does the great Thanksgiving. But before he does all of that, Jeff offered this invitation, and I remember it well. He said, perhaps you're here this morning, and you're wondering if you should come to this table. We want you to know that if you are here this morning, if you put your faith in Jesus' victory over sin and death, we not only welcome you, we beg you, come and here receive the presence of the Lord. And you still may be wondering, am I welcome? You are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. And my friend said that as he was saying that about you being welcome, he was looking right at me. So I figured you had told him everything I had told you about what I had done. And I said, no, I never told him any of that. And then my friend proceeded to tell me this. He goes, you know, dude, I'm going to tell you something. He's like, you never realize that that shame that you carry and your desire to try to fix things on your own will never ever be satisfied, but God doesn't want you to carry that. Do you know that God wants you to give that to him and just trust in him and to allow him to forgive you and take that shame away from you? Did you know that? And I thought to myself, have we not been talking for the last eight to nine years? And what I'm saying is this, that wasn't about me. Jesus did the work. Jesus did the convincing. Jesus opened the eyes. Jesus did the saving. We have to simply tell the story and live with the end in mind because people are out there who are hungry and they will respond. So summary, it's on your notes. God is always at work, even when we are in the wilderness, and I would say especially when we are in the wilderness, God has gone before us preparing the way, 
So we are never where God doesn't know, or we're never surprised. God is never surprised by where we're at. He is always preparing the way. Crisis will always lead, serve to indicate where our faith is. So here's where we do our soul work. When crisis arrives, where do you turn? And if it's not to Jesus, then there's the invitation for us to do some soul work to turn to Jesus. Not to, not to be shamed, not to run away, not to be self-condemning, but to reorient ourselves to the life that Christ is calling us to. Our calling is to abide in the love and to share the life of Jesus. Live with this end in mind. So if I can have all the kids come up, it's time for your pop quiz. Kids, kids, kids. Can we make an announcement that the 1030 service is going to start at 1045? I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. I'll be quick. You guys are awesome. Okay. Woo! All right, here are, here are my questions. Here are my questions. What does the name Joshua mean? Salvation. salvation. Yep, Yahweh is salvation, or the Lord is salvation. Okay, how many spies did Joshua send? James. He sent two, and what was the name of the person who helped them in Jericho? You don't know? That's okay. Rahab. Yeah, so here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. I just encouraged all of us to live with the end in mind. We just did a baptism today. Each, many of you were baptized, and some of you will be baptized here as you, as you grow in faith. The idea is this, that the church is a, all of us. We're all involved. Am I any more important to Jesus than you are? No. You are a part of this community. And what I want you guys to know is this. You're going to live in a world that sometimes things will happen that might scare you, that might seem a little uncertain. I don't know what scares me. What? Noises. Noises, yep. Downstairs in the basement, we might have the same basement. <laughs> but all that being said is this, you guys. You guys are all disciples of Jesus. Which means even now, you guys can live with this end in mind. That God did something amazing in the world when he resurrected Jesus from the dead. He's making all things new. Which means God wants you to join him in that work. So you might have friends at school who are sad, who feel forgotten and lonely. That God wants you to go and be a friend to them. That's one way you can live with the end in mind. God wants you to be obedient to your parents, even when it's hard. God wants you to be nice to your siblings, even when that's harder. But part of it is this, is that you are a part of the church today. And what God wants for you, us to do, is to encourage you to live with the end, of, end in mind. To be a part of this new thing that God is doing through Jesus. And it will look different for each one of you. But in all things, you guys can live as disciples of Jesus, whether God calls you into law or the classroom or to stay at home to raise kids or to be a teacher or a lawyer, maybe even a pastor, although that's a tough one. I'd rather you guys do other things. Because you know what? You're going to have friends who need to hear the good news, and God wants you to share it with them, okay? So I'm going to pray for all of us, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Do you guys stay here? And then I'll dismiss you. Uh, I'll, dis I'll dismiss you after the, I'll dismiss you when I say you go. <laughs> How's that? So gracious Father, we thank you for these, these young people, these students, these kids. We're grateful that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. We pray for all of us, Lord, that I pray for all of us that we would live with the end in mind, that the promises and hope of forgiveness and salvation we be met with the expectation of new creation and transformation. Lord, we live in a world that's fraught with evil. Help us not to be overcome by it, but to overcome evil with good. And I pray, Lord, that our lives would be an example for these young kids, but that, Lord, that as these young kids also live their lives, that we would be encouraged by their example of faith and of courage and of being salt and light in a world. And so together now with the voices of our dear children, let's pray the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everyone look at me. This is for everyone, but I want you guys, especially to receive this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.